I'm Mr. Eliason. Welcome to A-Push. Today we're going to return to our friends down in the Virginia colony. And unlike our friends from Massachusetts Bay, as you may be able to tell by this title, things are not going to go quite as well for them, for the settlers down in Jamestown in Virginia, as they went at least for the Puritans in Massachusetts. At least the Puritans who were willing to live by the strict religious values and laws that the Puritans had established. So let's dive in. Here are our main objectives for today, so, so take a moment and pause to take them in. And let's kick off our story. So, as you hopefully remember from the previous time we visited Virginia, the Virginia colony had kind of a fraught start. The whole, the whole not being able to feed themselves, several wars against the Powhatan people, John Rolfe marrying Pocahontas in order to try to establish peace between the two sides. So that was the first Powhatan War. The second Powhatan War, as we talked about in, pre in a previous lesson, had the Powhatans burn Jamestown to the ground and kill a third of their inhabitants. And so we'll give you a second here to read, read a condemnation on the government of Virginia. But the main takeaway here is pretty straightforward. In general, the leadership in Virginia was not particularly effective at protecting the welfare of the vast majority of the colonists. And as you can see, there's almost constant conflict with Native Americans due to the Jamestown settlers incre uh, increasing encroachment upon their land, usually for the growing of cash crops, which shockingly, the Native Americans did not super appreciate. So. In the third Powhatan War, Powhatan himself, the, the chief of the tribe, was killed, and the Native Americans were forced out of the Tidewater region along the coast, settling in the sort of backcountry regions, and this is going to be relevant for us moving forward. The backcountry was not as near fertile farmland, but it did provide enough sustenance for the Native Americans to reestablish their society now on the frontiers of what is becoming the Virginia colony. So those are our three rounds of Powhatan Wars. Life in Virginia, as we talked about before, revolved around tobacco. Tobacco saved the Virginia colony because this milder strain of Caribbean tobacco grew incredibly well in the sort of fertile soil along the James River and the Chesapeake Bay. And so this cash crop, because of course it's an addictive drug, sold incredibly well and allowed the Virginia colony to thrive and flourish. The only problem with tobacco is that it's, it's although it grows relatively well, the harvesting and drying of it is relatively labor intensive and unpleasant. And even today, the harvesting of tobacco uses a lot of very specialized uh, personal protective equipment. And even then, people who work in tobacco fields often suffer from nicotine poisoning and other ailments. So imagine working back in the 1600s, sands all those things, handling tobacco all day with your bare hands. It's going to be really unpleasant, and it's going to lead to a significant mortality rate for the people who are working in the tobacco fields. In order to try to encourage more people to come over and settle the Virginia colony, because of course the Virginia colony was struggling to both keep its people alive because they were getting killed by Native Americans and also dying of tobacco poisoning, the London Company established what's called the Headright System. So I'll give you a moment to take this in. The effect of this is that it allowed people to, if people who could pay their way to Virginia, they would get free, they would get uh, access to free land. And so this kicked off a whole wave of indentured servants. Because although there weren't all that many people who could pay their way to Virginia, a loophole was established by which wealthy Virginians would pay the way of servants or uh, of landless laborers in England who could then come across to Virginia. They would, they would settle and then work on the land of the landowner for a series of years as part of this indentured service contract. And then at the end of this time, they'd be given their own land. This was incredibly appealing for landless workers in, in England because most landless laborers in England would have absolutely no hope of ever getting their own land. And so taking a risk to travel across the ocean to get a chance to take your, get your own land was a great opportunity for them. As we talked about, a combination of disease, Native Americans, and tobacco poisoning made the life expectancy of, Virginia, of, of the average Virginian only a couple years. And so for the first years of the headright system, 90% of the indentured servants died. 
This did not mean that they did not, this meant, of course, that they didn't get their land. But in addition, it meant that the wealthy landowner who'd paid their passage could take possession of that land. So for the wealthy Virginians, this became an incredibly lucrative proposition. They would bring over indentured servants, get free labor out of them. When the indentured servants would inevitably die, they would then get to take the land that was originally set aside for those servants, leading to the, the creation of massive plantations within the Tidewater region of Virginia. As you can see here, unlike the list of emigrants that we saw last time, this is, the, uh, this is a, a list of uh, people heading for the colony of Virginia, hopefully you can see some distinctive differences and then can make some predictions about how this breakdown of settlers is going to affect the development of the Jamestown colony and the larger area of Virginia. My, one of my, this is one of my favorite documents, and you should 100% pause to read it in its entirety. It lays, out, it lays out the experiences of an indentured servant and his feelings about what it's like to be in Virginia. As our friend Richard Frethorn told us, living as an indentured servant in Virginia was very unpleasant. But over time, the survival rate increased, both because the Native Americans had been driven off the coast, more of the land had been drained, and so endemic mosquito-based diseases were less common, and in general, they got better at harvesting tobacco without killing their labor force. And so, as more indentured servants died, more of, the land, they, more of them were getting their land, but this land, noteworthy as this land, was not in the wealthy, sort of fertile Tidewater region of Virginia. Instead, it was in the back country. This is because most of the wealthy, of the incredibly lucrative and fertile land had been snapped up by large, wealthy Virginian planters. And so these new indentured servants would, were given less good land out on the frontier. This created immediate conflict because you hopefully remember who else is currently living out on the frontier. Groups of Native Americans. And so we, we very quickly get this development, this stratified social and economic period, period of Virginian society. The southern planter class is on the top. They're the wealthiest and most powerful. Then you've got the yeoman farmers, your backcountry farmers, who have some land and power, but much less than the wealthy planters. Below them, you have indentured servants, tenant farmers, and people who don't have land. And then at the bottom is going to be enslaved people and Native Americans. We haven't gotten to enslaved people yet, but enslaved people make up a, a part of the story of Virginia going all the way back to the early days of the colony. In the early days, enslaved people were treated much more like indentured servants, but over time this is going to change for a whole host of different reasons. The Virginia, the Virginia colony established their own government, the House of Burgesses, and the politics of the colony of Virginia became a tiny microcosm of the politics of England. The House of Burgesses was a legislative house that was dominated by wealthy planters. Its members were elected from amongst the citizens of the Virginia colony. And then there was a royal governor who made and enforced the laws. The House of Burgesses controlled the funding for the government, and so there was a constant battle between the governor and the legislature for control over uh, legis uh, uh, creating laws and also for allocating money. Very similar to the way in which kings of England had constant battles with the Houses of Parliament over funding, taxation, and their agendas. Eventually, this system collapsed into violence when farmers on the back country had some disagreements with Native Americans. As this document shows, the governor of the colony attempted to set up a meeting with Native Americans in order to resolve tensions, but because the central, the central conflict was that the backcountry settlers wanted to live on the Native Americans' land, and the Native Americans did not want to be pushed off their land, it was very difficult to find an effective compromise that would sa satisfy both sides. So, a, back country, a recently arrived backcountry farmer named Nathaniel Bacon wrote this letter to William Berkeley, which I'll give you what you should pause and read, condemning him for his lack of action and then and declared and decided that he was going to take matters into his own hands. Bacon's rebellion constituted Nathaniel Bacon putting together a militia and massacring local Native American tribes, generally not paying any attention to whether or not those Native tribes were actually the ones that he was in con conflict with, and in fact, generally they weren't. In fact, the Natives that, that uh, Bacon massacred were a group of relatively peaceful Native Americans who had been trading furs with the rest of the Virginia colonists, leading to a conflict. Berkeley, outraged that his fur trading revenue had just dried up, declared Bacon an outlaw. So Bacon and his contemporaries then marched on Jamestown, Berkeley fled, 
Bacon and his followers burned Jamestown to the ground, as we can see here in this document. And then Bacon died. His, people, his, uh, his rebellion collapsed. English forces returned to restore order. And the status quo was reestablished. The main takeaway from this is that the policy of bringing over indentured servants and settling them on backcountry land is somewhat problematic because over time the indentured servants would begin to significantly outnumber the wealthy plantation owners living in Tidewater and would vie with them for political power. So the, the colonists of Virginia came up with a plan to import laborers that they would never have to free, give rights to, or have to vie with for political power. And that answer was enslaved Africans. Although ens enslaved Africans had made up a part of the labor force of Virginia in the aftermath of Bacon's rebellion, the slave trade picked up substantially, both because life expectancy had increased, demand for non-indentured labor increased, and the English had displaced the Portuguese as the primary traders of enslaved people, and therefore enslaved people were cheaper and more readily available within the British colonies. And so we got a significant rise of slavery. The triangular trade connected in the North American colonies to the rest of this very troubling network. And we'll have to spend a lot more time talking about the legacy of American chattel slavery.